Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing great. This is Chaplain Willette, and we are going to do a little chapel time in the book of First Peter, chapter 2. Um, I started Peter with you guys uh, a month ago, and I thought I'd continue on, and such a beautiful book of the New Testament. Peter was an apostle. Remember, I let you guys know he was a big fisherman guy. And uh, it's wonderful to read his books, First Peter and Second Peter. And most people believe that actually the Gospel of Mark, you might have heard of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Mark was from the memoirs of Peter. So uh, it says, Therefore rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies de crave the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So this is a familiar way that the New Testament writers wrote, and that was in light of kind of all that God does or has done for you in Jesus Christ, paying for your sins, giving you new life. Just as the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, so that same Spirit is in those who believe, giving us a new life, not just for the here and now, but for the life to come. And Peter says, in light of all that, meaning in light of that solid foundation of who Jesus is and what he's done for you, then we do this. And that's always uh, a good pattern. In light of knowing your, uh, where you're at in your relationship with God, the stability, the, the strong foundation that it stands on, now let's move forward in progress in our life and let's work on things. And we all need to work on things, every one of us. Now, Peter gives a list here. And he says malice and all deceit. You get the idea of malice being something that is harmful towards other people, to have malice in your heart towards people, a hatred, a strong hatred, right? All deceit, tri trickery, any form of manipulation, we might say. Hypocrisy. The idea is uh, to be a hypocrite or an actor or an actress, acting one way but doing living another way. Um, the idea of envy is wanting what other people have and you're upset when they get something that you don't have or that you don't get. Maybe they achieve something you have not achieved yet and so you become envious of them. And then it says slander, where we get the idea of diablo, right? Devil, slanderer, um, a gossip Someone who's, you know, talking about someone else uh, behind their back. It says, and then it says, of every kind. So Paul, our Peter gives this idea of just, okay, there's many more I could have named, but it, it, it's uh, of every kind. So therefore, rid yourself. And that's something that we should be working on all the time, ridding ourselves of things in life. So it's good to do self-inventory, to look at your life and go, hey, what are the things that I really uh, need to rid myself of? Um, what are those things? And maybe make a list of it. Maybe write it down. Maybe talk to someone that you trust about those things. And maybe you guys can work through it and pray about it. And it's always great to just start even praying about those things and asking God to help you in that area of your life. But it's always on the back of that strong foundation that you have. So think of it this way. Because a child knows that the family is for them, the mother and the father are for them, then that child can now live in a way of working through things as they get older, growing up, working through situations and issues. And they, they, they do so from acceptance, from the love, from the compassion, from the empathy and the sympathy that are given to that child repetitively as he grows up. 
So that child has, in a sense, a freedom to be able to experience and to be able to work through things as they get older, to make mistakes, and then go to the parent and say, hey, I made a mistake. And they know that they're not going to get beat up or smacked down. and Because when a c- child gets smacked and hit, his foundation starts crumbling, right? He doesn't have a safe place, a person that he can go and he can trust those people that should be the closest to that child or not and so Peter says hey in light of who Jesus is and how much he loves you and that he is for you um, and the Bible says he who puts his faith in Jesus Christ shall never be put to shame you don't have to worry about shame we all struggle with the same things there's nothing that you do That hasn't been done before, and it's not something in all of us human beings. We all have envy. We all have hypocrisy. We all have malice. We all have deceit, and many other things that roll through us as human beings. And so we shouldn't be shocked by one another's sins because we all know that we have them as well. The human condition is one that we just tend to look at other people's sins that are on them with disdain. And we tend to neglect at the same time our own sins. You might see that in your own life where you don't really want to do a self-inventory and look at your own stuff or admit your own failures uh, according to God's law. But Instead, it's easier, much easier, to look at other people and critique them and criticize them. So Paul says, let's get rid of that and let's work on our stuff. And we can because we got a God who loves us, who's for us. We're not no longer condemned because of our failures, because uh, Jesus bore our sins on that cross on the tree for us. So that's what Paul gets at. In that little section. And man, that's an important truth for us to get. Uh, It's hard to work on things in your life if you don't have a safe place to do so and you don't feel that uh, there is an acceptance. You're not, in a sense, working on things from victory. Not to, not because you need victory, but because you already have victory and now you can work on things. See, there's already a victory that's yours. So you already have the solid foundation of who Jesus is, what he's done for you, and now you can go ahead and work on your stuff with safety, with grace, wonderful mercy, beautiful words, beautiful thanksgiving too. And I love that word thanksgiving because when someone says, hey, I'm thankful, you know, the question always has to be asked is, well, who are you thankful to? Yeah, are you just thankful to, are you thankful to God? Are you thankful to your family? What are you thankful for? And who are you thanking? Um, and those are important ideas to think about. And the reason why is because if we have a culture that is non-thankful, then we become narcissistic. And that is just a severe form of selfishness where we think everything that we have, we deserve to have, and it's by our own hands that it's been given to us. And so we become super selfish, super self-righteous, and all that kind of attitude can do is look to other people and judge them for not being like yourself. That's all you can do with that kind of narcissism. You look at everybody else and you say, Man, you don't have it because you didn't do what I did. And see, that's what happens when you throw out thanking God because you realize that God had a place um, in your life, that things that happened in your life, they were miraculous to get to where you're at, that there was little divine appointments here and there. There was a providence of God that was working in your world. And when people realize that, they become thankful. Thank you, God, for that kind of attitude. But without God, then all you can do is thank yourself. 
and uh, for what you have because it's been done by your hand and your hand alone. And that must mean that you have control of everything in your life. And um, we know that's not really the case. There's a lot of variables uh, to for why we're where we're at today. And so um, because we're thankful to God, you know, now we can, you know, appreciate that Thanksgiving, that thing or that thing that he's done. And now we can start working on things. We have an appreciation in our life. So um, it's. It's a wonderful passage, therefore rid yourself of all malice and deceit. And it says, like, newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. And just as a baby needs to partake of milk, because there's nutrients in that milk to help that baby grow, but then when that baby gets to a certain age, milk ain't going to do it. That baby needs other nutritional uh, food items. And, but the Bible stresses that we should always, like newborn babes, desire the pure spiritual milk. The idea is we should always go back to the basics, always go back to simple things about God's love for you. What, why did Jesus come on, on the earth? Why did he live the life he lives? What does is, what is his grace towards me uh, mean? What does his mercy towards me mean? Just, you know, focused on those beautiful things of Jesus Christ. And it says, so by that you may grow up in salvation. And the idea there is that salvation, though we are saved, the Bible says, the moment you, you give your life to Jesus Christ, there's a continuation of that salvation. We call it sanctification. Just It comes from the root to be holy, set apart, sanctified. Um, when something's holy and set apart, it's special. So the idea is that you're special, you're set apart. And as you work on yourself, you know, and go by going to God and uh, being thankful for your life and uh, being thankful for Jesus and saying, hey, help me in the areas of my life, you start growing up. You start, in a sense, uh, moving on to maturity. And so that means just like in a sport, you, in order to mature in it, you have to work on the basics over and over again. So it's important to always go back to what we call orthodoxy or um, the basic teachings of the Bible. And you should know those things as you grow in your walk with God. And that's why it's important to be reading the Gospels understanding the teachings of Jesus, reading your New Testament, understanding the teachings of the New Covenant. Um, those are very important, and that's how you start getting an understanding. And it's, believe me, being in the Old Testament is super important. And that's something that you want to do. I read the, uh, started reading the Old Testament when I was 17 years old um, without even reading the New Testament first. And I found it absolutely fascinating but it'll really help you to understand some of the wording in the New Testament because the, those Jewish New Testament people are quoting the Bible they had, which is their Old Testament. But understanding the foundations, you know, you might ask, well, Bo, what are the foundations of the Christian life? Well, who Jesus is, you know, what he came to do, you know, that he rose again on the third day, that he ascended back into heaven that he sent his Holy Spirit to enter into you so that you would have a new life, a life not based on your own spirit, but on his Holy Spirit. Um, so some of those things are just the basics. And you keep learning and growing in the, the understanding of those basics as you read. And that's what it's talking about. That's how you start growing and understanding more and more and getting, again, into maturity. Uh, so it says, now that you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So it go, he just kind of does this little circle. You know, in chapter one, Jesus is awesome. And in light of that, he gets into chapter two. Hey, let's move in this direction. Let's grow. Let's be thankful. Let's rid ourselves of some other stuff. And then he gets back into that idea of taste and see that the Lord is good. You've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So, hey, let's move forward. And the reason why it's good, why the Lord's good is because salvation eternal life life with god is not based on your work 
It's based on Jesus' work for you. That's why it's precious and awesome, right? It wouldn't be awesome if, it, if I said to you guys, hey, the only way you get into heaven is by observing these commandments. And if you did them 100%, then you could you know, dwell with a holy God. That wouldn't be good news. That would be a bad news situation. You guys would all go, man, I can't do that, Bo. That's not going to work. And that's true. You're, it's, it's not going to work. But that's not the message of the new covenant. The new covenant in Jesus Christ or new agreement with God in, in Christ Jesus is that you are saved by grace through faith in him. So as you trust in the work of Jesus Christ to pay your price on that cross, you are saved by that faith, that just trusting in him. So the Bible says it this way. This is the work of God. You want to know what the work of God is? Jesus said to believe in the one whom the father has sent, which is him to believe in him, believe in what he's done for you. You put your trust in him. That is good news. That's why we can taste and see that the Lord is good because it truly is awesome. I mean, that's why Jesus is cool because he can forgive you and he does forgive you as you come and trust in him. So, hey, hope you guys have a great one. I wish I could see you more um, at all, actually. But we'll see what happens in the future. Um, you guys take care, okay? Um, beautiful day in Tucson. I hope it is where you guys are at, too. Take care. Bye-bye.